So, I, Brian, I, I brought you here today because we're not having Crucible this week. And because we're not having Crucible, that means that we miss out on the opportunity to share this passage of Revelation. We just don't have time to, to talk about it. But instead of skipping over it entirely, I thought it'd be really cool to maybe have you sit down for a second and share with us uh, maybe some important insights from this passage. Is there anything that you would want underground people to know about this text? Um, sure, yeah. And, and it is maybe the, um, the schedule that we're on, unfortunately. We don't want to miss Revelation 17. It's not like it's not in there for a reason. Um, and it's a tricky, tricky one, you know, as, as many of these middle chapters are a little bit tricky to deal with, mostly because they deal with images that are, that are not just hard to understand because Revelation is full of images that are hard to understand, but because the images are disturbing images, really. Um, you have this, this woman who is referred to as the great prostitute, you know, the great harlot. And she, she uh, represents a city. And even that's sort of strange. You know, we're not used to talking about cities or nations and personifying them in that way. But that's exactly what John is doing. That's part of his vision is he sees a woman, but he understands it's not a woman. It's a, it's a people group. It's a, it's a history. And, and because he, re, he refers to her as Babylon, but of course Babylon is a, is a, a defunct empire, but they would have understood the, the, the moral bankruptcy of Babylon, the, the idolatry of Babylon, the, the treachery, the violence of Babylon. And of course it's, it's history of, of oppressing the people of God. But, but there is no Babylon. So it, there are clues in the text, you know, the, the, the seven mountains, that, which is almost certainly a reference to the seven hills of Rome. And, and in their time, in their day, Rome is Babylon. It is their Babylon for their time. But because, you know, John doesn't choose to refer to Rome as Rome, but refer to Rome as this other word, this symbolic word, it just, it's a way of, of making that reference echo through time in every era. It makes us ask the question, you know, who is our Babylon? So for them, for them, the, the new Babylon is Rome, but, but, but what is it for us? And, and it, 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 it's not just the idea of empire or conquest, but it's the idea of, of a way of life, a way of doing things. And if you participate in that way of doing things, you'll succeed, you'll prosper you'll uh, be advanced in some way. And this is, this is how this great city, this mother of prostitutes, and, and even that image is, is, is a harsh image, but, but it's, it's, it has to be. You know, the idea of uh, a woman who is, who is by nature and design something extraordinarily beautiful and precious, and, and, and even her sexuality being something that is a gift from God to be returned to God, and yet it being, it being, it being squandered and, 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 and soiled and sold for money, for, for economic gain. And this is, this is what um, Babylon requires of us. It, is to, it, it makes us sell ourselves, sell our sacredness uh, for something cheap and but but you you know you asked me what what's the one thing the one sort of takeaway um that if if we you know, are, are not going to get together to talk about this text uh we don't want to miss i think it's this i this image in there that this this woman rides literally rides this is part of the 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 vision on the back of the beast this wild animal, this wild beast, she rides on it. And, and she is rich beyond her wildest dreams and luxurious lifestyle. And, but she gets there on the back of the beast. That there, there is a kind of prosperity, a kind of advancement or, 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 or success that comes on the back of the devil. You, 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 you ride him to that kind of prosperity. And, um, 
And that image then turns at the end of the passage in, 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 in verse 16, I think, where it says that the beast hated her and, and strips her naked and, and, and burns her and devours her. It's, it's, such a, it's such a such a powerful irony that she, she relies on the beast to get her where she is, sells her sacredness to him, and in the end he kills her anyway. He is not her friend, even though it seems that way. It made me think of um, Siegfried and Roy, you know, the, the great uh, illusionist tiger lion act that they had, you know, famous. And I think it was October 3rd, 2003, Roy, Roy Horn, he was, I guess he was like the, the animal specialist. He was the tiger tamer. And uh, he had this very bizarre uh, relationship with his animals. In fact, they have this mansion and tigers and lions just move freely throughout their mansion, go wherever they want, in and out of the kitchen, you know, wherever they want. But he had this, he had this approach uh, Roy Horn did, where he would, what he called affection conditioning, where when the, the tiger cub was six months old, he would take it into his bed and sleep with it every night and basically become the tiger's mother, become the tiger's, like make this intimate bond. Because I guess when it's a cub, it, you know, it can't kill you, it can't hurt you, and, and, and it's still developing, forming. And so, at least for him, he thought he was developing this relationship, this, this trust, this, this friendship with these tigers. Well, the tiger, on this fateful day, this, this final performance by Roy Horn in, in Vegas, he takes this 480-pound cat who he's, he's worked with for like six years. And, and you have to bear in mind, this is 40-some this is years that they've been doing this, the two of them, working with these animals. He takes the cat on this little stage. It's very close, maybe, maybe the distance between me and you, between the audience and this animal, this powerful cat. And something, the, the tiger sees something in the audience that gets it his, his attention, and he starts walking towards it. And uh, uh, Roy gives this command to stop, to come back, and the tiger ignores him. He loses the chain that he's holding, this leash that he's holding the tiger on, and he just starts walking towards the crowd. Well, of course, he panics, and he realizes how close the tiger is to the crowd. So he, he maybe heroically even, stands, puts his body in between the crowd and the tiger. And the tiger keeps advancing, keeps pushing forward, and he starts giving this command to stop, to release, and the tiger won't. He's ignoring him. And then he starts hitting the tiger on the head with this, this stick he had. And the tiger just doesn't obey, doesn't care. And eventually, as, as m most of us probably have heard this story or saw it on the news when it happened, the tiger just has enough, jumps up, grabs him by the throat, takes him down in one blow, sticks his, his teeth into his jugular vein, and carries him off stage like a limp rag doll. And that was the end of Roy Horn's tiger career. And that, that story is, uh, aside from its own kind of brutality, it, it, it means something. You know, there's a, there's a, a metaphor there. You know, you, you don't really tame tigers. You know, you, you, you think you do. And even 40 years of doing this, you, you really begin to believe that you're the master, that you are in charge, that you call the shots, that your little chain and your little stick and your little commands actually have power over this animal, this, this, this wild animal. But you never do tame a tiger, actually. You never do. And I don't know what goes through the mind of that tiger that day, but certainly it he just decided, I don't have to listen to you, and I never have had to listen to you, and I think I'm a little tired of you hitting me in the head with that little stick, and, and that's that. And the tiger goes back to being a tiger, and it doesn't matter all those years and all that training, and it is a tiger. And I just think that this is fundamentally the relationship that people make with the devil, with the enemy, with empire with Rome, with Babylon, with our version of that, uh, our, our modern Western uh, capitalistic, consumeristic, materialistic empire, which has a certain way of doing things. And if you'll do things that way, 
you'll succeed. You'll, you'll, you'll sell your soul, but you'll, you'll get the spoils of that kind of capitulation, you know, that, 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 that acquiescence. But any partnership with the devil always ends with his teeth in your throat. It always ends with you being hauled off the stage like a rag doll. There is no friendship there. There is no love there. I couldn't help but think of, as I was sort of, you know, musing about this uh, text, chapter 17, I keep thinking about Jesus' you know, identification of us as being the salt of the earth. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, I think that there is the possibility as believers that we lose our saltiness. He actually says that. If salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? And, and salt, it isn't just for flavor. Salt is about, uh, salt was a miracle in, in the first century world. It was, it was, had the ability to, to, to arrest decay. You know, you could put salt on meat and the meat would be preserved. It would last longer. So in times of winter or famine or whatever, you could, you could preserve meat and live longer and, and, uh, you know, it, it, it expanded the, the prospects of life and society. And so salt was m miraculous in, in one sense. He said, you're the salt of the earth. If you lose your saltiness, what good are you? So, so salt stops decay, it arrests decay. And if, we, if we're not arresting decay, if we're not holding back uh, evil and its, its plans, its accomplishment uh, in the world somehow, then we lose our saltiness. And, and on the one hand, I see a certain kind of Christian that you know, goes to the pubs and, 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 and drinks with the boys and, and, and smokes out and, and does all these kinds of things. And d there's no distinguishing characteristic between that Christian and empire and the world that they're a part of. And they've lost their saltiness, you know. But on the other end, I, I, nobody goes to a restaurant and orders a bowl of salt. You know, nobody says, mm, I'm just in the mood for salt today, wouldn't I? Mm, just, you know what, just forget it, waitress. I've got, I'll just take this salt container. Could you just give me a spoon and I'll just eat this, you know, thing of salt. I think I was in third grade and I was walking home from elementary school and we found, I don't know why or, or why I was there, but we found this box of rock salt. And uh, I was always up for a dare. And so one of my, uh, one of my friends said, I, I bet you won't eat it. I dare you. I dare you to eat it. I dare you to eat the whole box of rock salt. So I was like, I'll do anything, you know. So I just poured the box of rock salt in my mouth. And uh, anyway, needless to say, I mean, within seconds, like 10 seconds, I'm, I'm hurling on the side of the road, you know, at lunch, breakfast, everything was gone. Uh, nobody eats salt. You don't just eat salt. So salt isn't anything by itself. So on the one hand, we, there's the potential that our relationship with the world is capitulating. We're riding on the back of the beast and we we lose our saltiness. And on the other end, if we just sort of like withdraw from the world, we withdraw from the fight, then we're just a big bowl of salt and that doesn't preserve anything. That doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't succeed in being salt. So whether it is like impotent or whether it's hyperpotent, we're not transforming. The, the, the end result is we aren't changing the world. We aren't a part of making it somehow holier or better. So, so, so I, when I think of this text, I think, what is our relationship then to empire? What is our relationship to Babylon or to the beast? You know, it's like we have to be close enough to it, in it, connected, that we can fight it, that we can be its adversary, that we can be an alternative. So we have to be in empire to rescue people from empire. We cannot just retreat to the hills. But at the same time, we cannot play its game. We can't be, we have to be distinct in, in, in every way to, other than it. So, so the, our proximity to the beast is, is very close. And there's this uh, contrast between this, this great prostitute and, and the people of God, who is the bride of Christ, two women, one who gives her, her purity, her, her, her femininity, her beauty to God, and the other that gives it away to the highest bidder. And man, that's the church. That, those are the two options of the church. To either give our soul and ourself and our, 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 our sacredness to the highest bidder or to give it to God. And of course, if we do give it to God, then we are salt of the earth and, and we are close to the devil and we are close to, to everyone who's capitulating, but we're not.
and we stand apart, we stand alone. That, that's what jumps out at me. That's what I don't want us, if we, if we don't have this week to study this text together in crucible, that's what I don't want us to miss.